I never wanted to out the gate charge money to our audience. I never wanted to have a private Facebook group you had to pay to get into or pay to like read the articles or whatever it might be. The only thing that we ever asked for money for or compensation for was the events itself. And that was really logistically, we had to do that to, to get the right amount of food and all these things. And that ticket price actually has not changed since the first Create and Cultivate. We've added higher tier tickets like VIP and things like that. But we want to keep it the lowest barrier to entry because the goal of Create and Cultivate was never to monetize the audience. Hi, and welcome to Female Founder World. I'm your host, Jasmine Garnsworthy. And today I'm chatting with Jacqueline Johnson, founder of Create and Cultivate. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you going? Good. How are you? Very well. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to chat. I'm such a huge fan. So I'd like to start the podcast by asking guests um, just to tell us about their company in their own words and to give some insights or quick facts to let people know kind of where you're at in the founder story, what stage the company is at. So if you could introduce us to Create and Cultivate for those who don't know you. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm Jacqueline Johnson. I'm the founder and CEO of Create and Cultivate. We are a media company for ambitious women, most well known for our conferences and offline events. But we also have a media platform which reaches around a million women monthly through our sites, social newsletter, podcasts, etc., where we provide real talk, advice and information for women looking to create and cultivate the career of their dreams. The company has been around for a while. Um, It's been around for almost I want to say 10 years in terms of ideation. It didn't really become a company until like five years in, but we are completely self-funded. But we recently um, had the company acquired in March. So yeah, we're kind of, I guess, later stage um, in the business in terms of where we're at as like a startup. Congratulations on the acquisition. I read about that um, when it happened earlier in the year. Thank you. Okay, so let's rewind just a little bit. Um, Can you take us back to the early days of your career? You know, you were really a kind of a pioneer in this digital editorial content space. So I think it'd be really interesting for people to hear what the landscape looked like when you got your start and how you kind of got your foot in the door. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to sound extremely old um, in this conversation. But basically, I started my career, I went to NYU, I studied journalism, magazine production, thought I was going to be an editor at a fashion magazine. Um, And this is all around the time like 2006, 2007, where the internet was sort of merging with media. And it was kind of this whole new world of blogs and uh, bloggers and uh, the word influencer didn't even exist yet. So Basically, I was sort of at the beginnings of that stage and I ended up working at a startup uh, called Attention, which was really the first, what we call word of mouth marketing agency, but in retrospect was a social media agency um, ahead of its time where we were setting up campaigns um, on Facebook and Instagram didn't even exist, but Twitter and things like that for companies like Mac Cosmetics, Blue Fly, which was, you know, really cool, really high profile fashion and beauty clients. Um, alongside that, I also had started a blog, um, which now sounds like, duh, but at the time there was like 12 of us on the internet. But I started a blog called Some Notes on Napkins. And really it was a scrapbook of things I thought were cool and interesting and linking out the product and, and things like that. Not a personal fashion blog, but it got a lot of traction um, and a lot of publicity. And so I kind of was a blogger and social media expert working my way through agency life. Uh, I ended up moving to Los Angeles through a company I was working for, got laid off, uh, was extremely depressed, had just moved to LA, had like no real friends or professional connections and ended up starting to freelance and then eventually start my first company, which was called No Subject. It was a marketing and influencer agency where we worked with brands, you know, ranging from Urban Decay, um, Dell, Microsoft, you name it, just a ton of different massive clients and smaller clients as well, um, where we provided services from influencer marketing, managing social media accounts, uh, strategy, uh, strategic partnerships, et cetera. 
And I had that company for about seven years. Um, I started it when I was 22. And basically, Create and Cultivate, the company that I have now, sort of started alongside that. Uh, basically, in starting my own company, I had no idea what I was doing. There was no resources like there are now that existed for women specifically that were launching their own businesses. And I made a ton of mistakes and wanted to get together with other women and kind of chat you know, about how it's all working, what people were doing, what advice they might have. And so the sort of bones of Create and Cultivate were started in a very small way uh, for three or four years through this agency before I decided to kind of separate out Create and Cultivate and have it be its own business. There is so much to dig into there with your story. I think I just want to touch on one thing. I also started my career. I was in Australia and a couple of years behind you, but not many. Um, and Australia is many years behind the US when it comes to um, digital trends and, and digital publishing. And I started as a fashion editor at Pop Sugar, which was pretty much the only digital publication in Australia at the time. I think we had like two others. Those who weren't in the space at the time can't really get their head around the fact that like, Vogue.com was a website. They weren't publishing there. It was like a, you know, it was a, totally. it was a um, corporate website kind of thing. Like this was, this has all happened so quickly. So the people who, who started off in that space at that time were the ones who really shaped the direction of this digital content kind of industry and space. So I feel like that has to be mentioned and appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it was it was a wild, wild time where everyone was figuring out how and what the internet was, how we use it, mm -hmm. how we talk about it, all the things. So I wanted to, um, to kind of rewind back to when you got laid off, you're in a new city. How did you get yourself back on your feet and think, okay, well, now I'm going to, I'm going to freelance and get those new clients. And it's a very different thing when you're self employed and in the freelance hustle, compared to having a steady paycheck. How did you kind of make that transition? Yeah, I mean, I definitely tried to get another job. Um, but it was interesting because at the time, Los Angeles was very entertainment and gaming focused. Like those were the two industries of which I had zero experience in. Like my background was primarily in marketing for fashion and beauty brands, which at the time was pretty much only in New York City. So I was not getting callbacks, not getting interviews, et cetera. So I ended up sending an email to my network saying, hey, moved to LA, got laid off looking for work. If anyone has any contacts or relationships or things like that. And um, luckily my network came to my rescue and I ended up getting a few clients out the gate and started to freelance. And one of the things that was kind of interesting and the way the story kind of rolls out is that I worked from home and I was new to a city. So I would go days and weeks without seeing anyone. <laughs> and I was like, I have no friends. I'm in the city. This is really depressing. And I ended up getting an, a shared office space with a group of people that also had their own sort of freelance gigs and hustles. And, and this was, again, probably pre-WeWork and all these things. And it ended up being the best thing for me because I ended up being able to network, make connections, and then eventually ended up starting that first company with someone that I was sharing the space with. Fascinating. I mean, today, I feel like it also seems like, you know, a no brainer to have a media company that's focused on female entrepreneurship. But at the time, there really was nothing else. Like you were very early on in this kind of, you know, women owned business kind of movement. What is it that helped you see that there was an opportunity there? And that was a space that was worth exploring? Yeah, it truly did not exist. Um, I honestly Googled. I Googled for help. I was trying to find information, the only about running a business, dealing with clients not paying, dealing with business partner issues, dealing with operating agreements. And every time I Googled, the only things that would pop up were like Legal Zoom or uh, Fortune Magazine, right? And so there was no real conversation happening, not only around small business and startups, but specifically in, in the female space. A lot of the issues I was running into were ageism. I was extremely young, um, sexism, obviously, um, and dealing with clients, you know, undervaluing me, not paying me or, you know, whatever it might be. And no one at the time was talking about these things publicly. How much do you charge was like, I mean, it would be like a completely inappropriate question. So it was really in the early days of it. And I just realized, I said, hey, look, like this is really interesting. 
once I started having the conversations with other women, everyone had the same exact questions. Everyone was looking for this information. And I said, why not just start it? And I think that's how all good businesses really start is by solving for a problem or something that's missing and seeing the white space. And so I ended up starting it with no intention of it being a business. Honestly, it was really selfishly me trying to just find more information in a community. And then it ended up being something much bigger. Yeah, I mean, today Create and Cultivate is, it's a very well-known media company, particularly with women who are career focused or want to start their own company or are growing their companies. And you have events, you've got content, there are paid tools. What was that kind of first offering or that first product that you had to share? Yeah. So initially, basically what had happened, I mean, early, early days before it was even set up as a company was an event. We put together a weekend at the Ace Hotel in Palm Springs. We had workshops, panels, conversations, dinners. It was about 25 people max. Um, So super intimate, really small, but really meaningful. And then that event really just caught momentum. When we decided to make it an actual business and invest some of our own capital into it, that is when we really invested in a team. And the team out the gate was primarily editorial because the most part event producers that we had worked with were freelance and and really strong. And I had worked with them at my previous company. So I knew that, you know, they could do the job. And and at the time I couldn't afford a full-time salary knowing I didn't know how many events we'd be doing, but editorial was something that was going to be the mainstay. So giving my, you know, background in blogging, what I realized was most conferences, uh, throw the event, have the website, sell the tickets, and then they go dark for the next six months until the next event. And what was interesting is that so much information is shared at these conferences and events, so much great content, and no one was like letting that live on beyond the event. So what I really set out to do was create this platform, launch it as a media company, have editorial content on there, sell tickets through there for the conferences, but then at the conferences themselves, create content from what was being talked about for people who maybe couldn't attend and keep that content and momentum going until the next event. So that was really where we invested out the gate was on editorial and of course the events. Yeah. I mean, you are really a masterful community builder and that is really like at the core and the foundation of Create and Cultivate and what you've built. Is that is that thing that's like intuitive to you or is it something that you've actively practiced over time? And do you have any advice for founders who want to create or believe that the best businesses are community driven businesses? Yeah. I mean, I think it really depends. I think community is really hard to build. I think it has to come from a super authentic place, which if you're going into it with a business plan and dollars and cents, et cetera, I think it becomes much more challenging. The beauty of Create and Cultivate was it came from such an authentic place of me truly struggling to find a community of women and then realizing no one was serving them and then being first to market to do that and doing it in a way that was truly authentic. I think the thing about Create and Cultivate that I always tell people is that I never wanted to out the gate charge money to our audience. I never wanted to have a private Facebook group you had to pay to get into or pay to like read the articles or whatever it might be. The only thing that we ever asked for money for compensation for was the events itself. And that was really logistically, we had to do that to to get the right amount of food and all these things. And that event, that ticket price actually has not changed since the first Create and Cultivate. We've added higher tier tickets like VIP and things like that. But We want to keep it the lowest barrier to entry because the goal of Create and Cultivate was never to monetize the audience. It was always to bring in the sponsors, to create cool experiences, to give access to this information. And that was something we did for a very long time. And then, of course, recently have brought on, you know, memberships and things like that. That being said, the information was so important to get out that I think coming from a place where there was easy access and access for all was extremely important for us. And so being able to do that was how we built a community so rapidly. One, no one existed in in the space at the time. Two, it was free or easily accessible. And three, we had really amazing people promoting us and supporting us that were speakers or mentors or things like that. So it was kind of a perfect storm of creating a community online. And again, these were early days. So now it's much more crowded, obviously. So it's a little bit more challenging. I love, you know, that you say you started from the the smaller events and kind of built from there. Do you think that um, people who are building or trying to build community based businesses now that starting with, you know, a small event, a small dinner, like and go from there is still a 
is still a valid way to build community? Or do you think that the landscape has changed so much that there needs to be a different approach now? I think it totally depends on your goal. If your goal is to create a massive company and make millions of dollars, then you have to have a different strategy. If your goal is to create this side project that you hope to monetize one day, but really you're passionate about the community that you're building, then absolutely intimate events are definitely going to be the future, especially given where we're at with COVID. So I think that's actually a really good way to think about it. I just think you have to approach it based on what your end goals are for the business. And a more generic question that I want to throw at you, what were some of those challenges that you found early on that kind of surprised you? Um, and how did you approach those and overcome them? I mean, so many challenges. I think the biggest challenge for Create and Cultivate, which is like a great problem to have was we just had rapid growth um, and we didn't scale quickly enough to match that rapid growth, which is really hard because for us, it was basically like, a firework. Like things just took off. We were so busy doing so well, but we couldn't keep up the hires with the level and amount of work that we were having. And a really good advice that someone gave me was you should be hiring six months ahead of when you think you need to hire. And I think that's such a great piece of advice because what we were doing was hiring when we were like desperate for that hire, which is the worst place to hire from because you typically bring on candidates that maybe aren't the best match because you're super desperate. You probably overpay those candidates because again, you're super desperate. And then those candidates usually end up leaving after you train them for three to four months, spend a lot of time and energy, and it just wasn't a good fit from the get-go. So I think for us, I wish I would have been more strategic in hiring ahead of the game, which as a self-funded company is really stressful because you have to be able to make that salary work. Another good tip I got was that, you know, bringing people on as contract to hire. So bringing people on for three to four months as a contract employee, seeing if it's a good fit, and then bringing them on for that full-time position before you have to get into the paperwork of benefits and vacation and PTO and like all these things that are, you know, time consuming and really challenging for small business owners. That was a lesson I learned further down the line that I wish I would have implemented earlier. So what did your, you know, early on, let's talk six months to a year into the business, what did your day look like versus the things that you're focused on and working on now in the business? Uh, Well, this is a really interesting question because I had sold my company, uh, no subject, the first business, um, kind of like at the same time that Create and Cultivate formed its own company. So I worked two full-time jobs for the first year of Create and Cultivate. So I was basically full-time at Small Girls PR, which was the company that bought my company um, as president of West Coast Operations, obviously making sure the acquisition was going well, servicing clients. And then I was basically like part-time slash full-time at Create and Cultivate because I was working like 150 hour weeks. So I would go between offices. I managed two teams. I was getting married. I bought a house. It was like the most nightmare year of my life. I honestly don't even know how I did it. It was like I blacked out every single day. But it was uh, a nightmare and extremely hard. But I think it was probably like like a year of adrenaline rush. And we were moving so fast on the Create and Cultivate side. And Small Girls was, you know, blowing up and, and really scaling and growing their business. So it was busy, to say the least. Um, and then eventually I went full time at Create and Cultivate after a year, which was obviously a huge relief because we were taking off. But yeah, so it was uh, very busy, very stressful. Highly do not recommend. <laughs> uh, when did you know it was time to kind of focus all of your energy into create and cultivate? Are there some metrics, some some things that you can share that might give people like some insights into thinking, okay, now's the time to take the leap? Yeah. So I was really on the fence about it for a long time. You know, I had the opportunity to either stay on with small girls or go do create and cultivate. And at the time, create and cultivate was a baby. It was making very little money. It was an industry I didn't really have expertise in. I mean, I had thrown events, but not conferences of thousands of people. So it was a huge risk. But what was happening with Create and Cultivate was there was a ton of momentum around the business, both on the consumer side and on the sponsor side. We were getting emails from brands that I would have died to work with in the past. And so when that started happening and there was so much excitement around the business, I knew that this was something special and I wanted to see it through as like a true entrepreneur at that time. So then I made the leap and obviously the rest is history. 
Something that I am really curious about and that I think about a lot is how did you, especially in the first business, like before you had the small girls PR acquisition, how did you stay focused and think, okay, I'm going to see this through and avoid the allure of getting a full-time job? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I kind of was obsessed with it succeeding. I definitely didn't want it to fail. I had a lot on the line. It was my personal reputation and we had really great clients. And also I had employees I needed to pay. So like I was, you know, aggressively trying to make that company succeed. And it, it was successful in many ways, but to be totally honest, there was months where I had to wire personal money into the business to pay people. Um, that's just the struggle of, running a small business and especially a business that relies on clients and income and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, by the end of it, no subject was doing, I mean, I want to say around 3 million in revenue. It was a tiny company, maybe four or five people. Um, and we had massive clients that we were servicing that, you know, had worked with us for years. So in my mind, that company was a huge success. Obviously small girls ended up acquiring it, um, which is a much larger agency out of New York City, um, which again, also was a success in my mind and a great home for the business after so many years. But I think it's, it's hard. I mean, there was definitely days I cried in the bathroom and then like wiped my face and went in and had a meeting with people and days where I was like, oh my God, I just want to throw in the towel. But I also come from a family of entrepreneurs and small business owners. And so really being able to call like my mom and, and kind of, you know, share these grievances with her and just saying like, look, like there's ebbs and flows to being a small business owner. There's good days and bad days. And you, you kind of have to just roll with the punches as much as you can. And once I sort of realized, like when you get to a certain point in your company, like your job is really putting out the fires and that's normal. And that's what everyone is sort of going through it's one of those things that you just sort of, you can't imagine your life any other way, right? You're just so used to that, that rush, that high, that low, and also being in control. Like, I think it would be really challenging, honestly, for me now to go back to a normal nine to five or nine to six or whatever it is. I've been my own boss for over, I don't know, 12 years, 13 years. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to go back to that. But I think also there's been a renaissance in small business and starting your own companies or side hustles. Um, and I think it's really great because I do think it gives you that sense of autonomy, but there's like grass is always greener for each for having a job or being your own business owner. Absolutely. Having gone through the acquisition process twice now, what learnings can you share? Like what did you learn the first time and what have you learned the second time? Um, well, it's a true nightmare. <laughs> um, no, it, it is. It's a very intense process. It, and it kind of consumes your life, I would say. So the first time going through it um, was a much easier process because it was a much smaller company. So there's less you know, kind of information you need to be able to pull together um, than you do when you're a much larger company and you've been around for a really long time. So the first time acquisition process, and, and the thing about acquisition, and this is what everyone sort of needs to think about when they're building their businesses, are you building a business to be acquired? Because there's differences in building a business to make money. There's differences in building a business to sell. There's differences in just building a business to have a business and live a good life and maybe break even every year. Um, if you're looking to be acquired, you have to kind of build for a couple different reasons. You have to build to be extremely profitable, you have to build to be complementary to a larger business, um, or you have to build to disrupt and create something completely different and outside of the box. Um, and for Crate and Cultivate, we had a few of those uh, boxes ticked. Um, and having gone through the acquisition process before, I knew I wanted to build Crate and Cultivate to eventually sell. So in doing that, you, you know, you get to a place where you build out your business, you have a good track record, you figure out, you know, obviously your financials, you get everything in order, and then you go out for a sale. And it's interesting because Crate and Cultivate had a little bit of people interested in buying us over the years. And then we also went out and kind of also talked to people throughout the year. And we ended up finding a home with private equity. Uh, but the acquisition process is extremely, extremely time consuming for your business. So my biggest piece of advice, if you are a extremely active CEO, meaning you play a large role in the day to day of the business, you're operational, 
bring someone on to help you manage that process. So the first time I basically led the entire process on my own. And then the second time I had a team, I had, you know, legal, I had a banker and our COO who really helped spearhead the process. So I could still focus on the business, uh, which is hugely important. And the last question that I ask everyone who comes on the show is just to share a resource, whether it's a book, a podcast, something that's kind of helped you along to be a better founder and to help grow your business. I mean, it's so funny because it's like when I listen to podcasts or read books, I like listen to true crime and like things that are completely not business related. But I did get a career coach a few years ago that I was always sort of skeptical about career coaches. I was like, what does this mean? I don't know. What do you talk about? But she's been a a game changer for me. Her name's Gretchen Jones. Um, You should definitely check her out. And it's been such an amazing resource to have a third party that you can talk to about your business, get advice, help coach you through difficult times and really be an advocate for you. Because as a CEO, I always say like, no one's going to tell you good job. (laughs) Like you have to tell everyone else good job. Um, And so it's nice to have someone that really has your back in that way. So I highly recommend if you're building a fast growing business, get a career coach. Um, I think it's hugely beneficial and something I wish I had done earlier. Oh, well, Jacqueline, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing your story and congratulations again on the acquisition this year. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Female Founder World. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts.